and I'll be reading from Psalm 73, uh, several selections, starting with 1 through 6, then 16 through 19, and finally 23 through, through 26, which I hope will capture the essence of the psalm. <clears throat> Truly God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pain, their bodies are sound and sleek. They, they, they are not in trouble as others are. They are not plagued like other people. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I perceived their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terror. Now 23 to 26. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me with honor. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion Forever. In this morning's passage, the psalmist is complaining to God that sometimes life just isn't fair. And sometimes it seems like all of life's nicest rewards go to the wicked. And people struggle with the very same issue today. How often you have heard it said, good guys finish last, or no good deed goes unpunished. In his book, Disappointment with God, Philip Yancey takes seriously the complaints of people who have tried Christianity and who have decided it just doesn't work for them. And the book challenges some of the cliches we use when we talk about the faith and, and honestly acknowledges that for many people, there is a big difference between what they are expecting and then what they actually experience. Of course, there are many books and articles and preachers who in an effort to be persuasive, practically guarantee dramatic evidence of God working in your life if you have faith and if you uh, are, are, are willing to make the right kinds of sacrifices. But then, if these people do not personally experience God working in their lives in a specific and, and powerful way, they can end up feeling deeply disappointed. They may question if there is something wrong with them. They, they may even feel betrayed. They've been sold a bill of goods and there's nothing in it. One, one woman, Yancey quotes, as speaking of how she always heard about this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but that she, quite honestly, never saw God, never heard God, never felt God leading in her life or sensed any kind of a relationship. And she said, there is either something very wrong with me or there is something wrong with what I have been told. 
Bob Garfield is a radio correspondent who happened into St. Albans, West Virginia, where he met a man named Mickey Davis. And Mickey was the owner, operator, of a seedy little bar and strip club located out along the side of the highway. But feeling that his life was on the wrong track, he began watching television preachers. And he started reading the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, where, where God's judgment upon sinners is just spelled out in lurid detail, and eventually decided it was time for him to switch teams. So he put an ad in the local newspaper that read, Fantasy Girls Closed, followed by the verse, What good would it do to gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Well, a, a, a television evangelist heard about his conversion and sent out a film crew, and with the cameras rolling, Mickey dumped more than $500 worth of beer and liquor, and he just poured it out into the gravel parking lot. And he tore down the Fantasy Girls sign, and with a can of red paint and a brush, he wrote, Jesus, in big letters across the front of the building. And he opened the place up for weekly worship services. He dreamed of converting this, this bar into a Christian restaurant. But you know, things really didn't go as he had hoped. First couple Sundays, the place was packed out with the, the curious. But then the novelty passed and the crowds fell away. And the idea of turning it into a restaurant really didn't fly either. You know, there's a big difference between a, a, a smoke-filled, sleazy bar with the old stained plywood beams on the ceiling and the walls stained with the nicotine from, from the cigarette smoke. And as a bar, they could keep it really dim. But as a family restaurant, people are looking for a different sort of experience. They want the place to be cheerful and bright and clean. Yeah. That was a big hurdle. He tried to get money from some televangelists and even tried going and talking to some local churches, trying to get them to subsidize his, his renovations, but I don't know, it seemed that his vision didn't fit their definition of mission. And all of this made Mickey rather, rather bitter. He said, you know, these preachers say, oh, we'll pray for you, we'll pray for you, but try telling that to your landlord or, or to the electric company. Even his conversion left him feeling unfulfilled. He said, I, I've never spoken in tongues. Never once was I slain in the spirit. God never spoke to me, at least not in a way that I could tell it was God. And as the months went by, Mickey found himself going broke. So the Jesus sign got painted over, and a new sign went up, the pink pussycat. Well, he looks back kind of philosophically upon his experiment with religion, said, well, maybe I, maybe I just didn't have enough faith, or maybe my commitment wasn't deep enough. And so in St. Albans, West Virginia, there is once again a CD bar and a strip joint out by the edge of the highway with a, a disillusioned owner who will tell you that he tried religion once, but it just didn't work for him. And that's, that's sad. It's sad to hear stories like that, you know. And, 
From time to time, I've heard television preachers, and some of them really deliver an excellent message. But you know, at its best, Christianity is not a solo, solitary religion. Can't help but think that Mickey would have done better if he had gotten involved with a community of believers where he could have talked to people, you know, different kinds of people, and checked out his assumptions, if he could have learned from their experiences, if he could have found encouragement for when he was feeling down, if he could have been challenged by friendly voices when he was, was wrong. I think it would have been so good if Mickey could have attended the pool thing, the picnic this afternoon at the Christakis's, and, and talked to people one-on-one. -on -one. He could have talked to people who were business people, who, who knew the ins and outs of, of real life and restaurantship, and, and he could have learned so much, and people could have encouraged him rather than being off by himself and, and, and going down with the ship. And I think about that sometimes. I worry about that because, of course, we have our, our virtual service Sunday morning. We have our sermon going out on, on YouTube. But, man, that's not the same as being with, with Christian people and interacting with people who, who care about you and can offer suggestions and tips and things from, from their own experience. I, I think Christianity has to be a, a community experience rather than something that someone does on, on their own. Well, being a follower of Jesus involves discipline. It involves obedience. It involves being changed and helping other people. There's a lot more to it than just making a list of all the things that we expect God to do for us. Frederick uh, Buchner died th this past summer. He was a Presbyterian minister. He was a popular Christian author. And in one of his books, he, he wrote that if God were to reveal God's self in a way that left no room for, for doubt or, or questioning, then a part of ourselves would be destroyed in that process. Part of our independence would be gone. There would no longer be any need for, for faith. We would lose our freedom to choose. We would no longer be the people we are. Sometimes we preachers try to oversell the faith. We, we put too much emphasis on the miraculous, the supernatural. People come to expect that they will see the, the flaming hand of God burning the Ten Commandments into their refrigerator door. You know, that, that sort of thing. They expect that their problems will be solved, that all of the dragons of life will simply drop dead at their feet. I think most of you have been Christians long enough to know that that is not the typical experience. By facing those dragons, by leaning upon God's help, we grow through the experience. We become stronger in the faith. We become different people than we were before. Rather than something flashy and spectacular, most of the time our, our relationship with God might be better compared with, with the old story of, uh, of the, the man who lost an expensive watch in the ice house. Back in the old days, they used to cut blocks of ice out of the lakes in the wintertime and they would pack them in sawdust and in straw and store it underground in these ice houses till the ice could be sold for refrigeration in, in the summertime. Do any of you remember 
having an ice man come? Okay, yeah, a, a, a number of you do, okay. Well, one day, one winter's day, while they were packing the ice house, the owner discovered he had lost his expensive pocket watch. And of course, wanting to get in good with the owner, the workmen were all tearing things apart, looking for it, trying to make a good impression with their enthusiasm. And, and, and finally, the owner's son just said, stop, 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 I will find it. Everyone, go away. Shut the door, leave me alone for a few minutes in the dark, and I will find it. And, and sure enough, 20 minutes later, he emerged with the watch. Well, how did you find it, they asked. And he explained, I just lay down on the floor. I lay perfectly still, hardly breathing. <laughs> and without everyone talking and shouting and kicking the sawdust around, Eventually, I was just able to hear it ticking. And I kept moving towards where I thought the, the sound was coming from. And eventually, I found it. Uh, not a very dramatic story. It wouldn't make for an exciting movie. But by keeping still, by, by listening, and by moving in the right direction, he found something of great value. Brings to mind the, the, the words of the psalmist, be still and know that I am God. Well, in, in the passage of the morning, we find that the psalmist is struggling with the difference between the way God has been advertised and the way God actually seems to be working in the world. Surely God is good to the upright. Surely God is good to those who are pure in heart. I mean, that's what he's been taught. This is the way God has been advertised. But he wonders, how can this be true when my life is so hard? Why are things so difficult for me? Why is it that evildoers seem to be having such an easy time of it. <clears throat> now we can all understand the, the value of, of personal struggle and how we grow stronger through the process, but the psalmist has noted that there are ungodly men and women who seem to break all the rules without shame, without embarrassment, and they don't have any pain, they are well-fed and expensively dressed, and they just indulge themselves in every pleasure imaginable. The language in one translation describes them saying that their eyes swell out with fatness. Uh, another translation, their arrogance is described by declaring that their tongue struts through the land. Well, it's clear that the psalmist is suffering with envy. How can it be that these evildoers are so prosperous? Shouldn't God be blessing the people who struggle to be righteous? Envy is something we must all struggle with from, from time to time. The Tenth Commandment states we should not covet. We should not envy and want for ourselves the things that belong to, to other people. Sounds so un-American not to be craving the, the newest car or the latest computer or the most advanced home theater system. We're under constant bombardment by advertisers who are trying to stimulate our desire for things that we don't yet have. And most of us have learned from our own experience that filling our lives with stuff doesn't really bring peace or contentment. A while back, there was a, a television interview with a, with a group of people who had all become instant lottery millionaires. And the interviewer asked the group, how many of you are happier today 
because of your winning. And not a single person raised their hand. One of them said, how many new suits can you buy? How many uh, new cars can you drive? Every time you get something nice, you discover it's not quite good enough because you see something even nicer. Well, there's an old teacher, uh, teaching of the rabbis that goes, who is wealthy? The one who is content with their life. Contentment comes from counting our blessings, not from taking an inventory of all that we think might be missing from our life. Well, maybe you're not troubled with greed or envy, but like the psalmist, there may have been times when things just don't make sense. Sometimes we wonder how there can be so much injustice and cruelty in the world, sometimes we say, where is God? Is God off taking a nap? Why isn't God doing something about this situation? Particularly when we, it seems like evil is getting the upper hand. Perhaps you have even said to yourself, what's the use of being a Christian? I see no advantage in it. You read the Bible, you go to church, you pray, you seek God's direction in your life, and look what it brings you. Things can still go terribly wrong while the evildoers of the world seem to prosper. The psalmist writes, verses 13 and 14, All in vain I have kept my heart clean, and I have washed my hands in innocence, All the day long, I have been stricken and chastened every morning. And then we come to the turning point in the psalm. Verse 17, where we read, Then I went into the sanctuary of God, and I perceived their end. Truly, Thou dost set them in slippery places. Thou dost make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakens. The psalmist went to worship God and began to see things from a brand new perspective. Up to this point, his thinking had been centered on himself, how he was feeling, how unfair things seemed to be. But upon entering the sanctuary, his thoughts began to focus on God. He began to see things from a different point of view, from the perspective of eternity, A lot of the things that people exchange their hours and days to obtain just don't seem so significant. He realized that he had forgotten the final end of the ungodly. He realized that pride causes the wicked to go too far and to move out onto slippery places. Suddenly there's a knock at the door, and the authorities come, and they fall to ruin. Certainly they maintain a facade of happiness, and everything is fine, but without the strength that God brings, without a purpose in life beyond themselves, Their lives are like empty shells that are ready to collapse and they are plagued by fears and the terror of things that are out of control. As it says in the Proverbs, pride goes before destruction, haughtiness before a fall. By listening to God's word, we will be better able to recognize what is wrong and what needs to be changed and what needs to be avoided within our own lives. By talking with and being in relationship with other Christians, 
we are less likely to be carried away by our own delusions. It's as we stay centered in God that our lives will bear good fruit for this life and the life to come. And finally, we, we read in the last couple verses of Psalm 73, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing that I desire beside you. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Amen.